Welcome back. If you're just joining the series, you may consider watching the setup video so you're ready to keep coding and learning. In this video, we will cover consolidating global styles, the first child pseudo-selector, display inline block, introduction to CSS grid, and how to define a dynamically resized image. Check the video description for a link to an article with the video transcript and code samples from this lesson. You may want to refer back to the first lesson that created our initial card HTML, episode 6. To begin this lesson, open our project in VS Code. If you are just joining us, you can download the starter project to catch up. See the link in the video description. In the terminal, type the start command, npm run start, to run the project. Open card-layout.html in VS Code and organize your screen to be split with the browser. Then update the browser URL to include slash card-layout.html. Similar to the last lesson, the first thing we need to do is create a dedicated style sheet for this page's styles. Since we do not wish to inherit styles from style.css, which is what is giving us the text colors. Create card-layout.css and then in our HTML file, update the style sheet link in the head from style.css to card-layout.css and save. We're nearly back to default browser styles, except we cheated a bit in the HTML lesson and added a handful of styles directly in the HTML. That technique is called inline styles and should be used sparingly. Because inline styles are closest to the element, they are calculated as having a higher specificity in the CSS cascade than element or CSS selectors. There are ways to override this, but it's an additional rule of the cascade to be aware of. Refer back to episode 11 if needed to learn more about the CSS cascade. Let's work on moving the inline styles into our style sheet. Looking at the layout we created, it seems reasonable to create two classes, card-row and card. We'll move the styles on the section element into card-row and the styles from the article elements to card. Then we'll replace the style attribute with the class attribute and the appropriate class, placing class card-row on the section and on the article class card. Be sure to save both the CSS and HTML files, and you can see our appearance is unchanged from what we created in the HTML lesson. For now, let's remove the second and third card so we can focus on the typography and card styles. Starting with typography, it would be nice to use what we already defined for the blog page, if we pretend that the blog and product layouts are pages of the same site. So let's create one more style sheet, global.css. Then open blog-layout.css, and let's move from the body rule through the paragraph rule to our new style sheet. Then also get from the container rule through to the body footer rule. Now, in both blog-layout.html and card-layout.html, we need to add a new style sheet link, and it needs placed above the existing style sheet link for the cascade to work optimally. Following that, we need to update the markup of our header and footer to match what we did for the blog page. As you can see, the spacing is not correct since they are missing the div with the container class. Then we'll add the container class to the main element, and our layout is looking much better already. We can now turn our attention to the card. And first we'll update the card styles with some other properties we've already learned about. We'll add border radius, seven pixels, and box shadow, two pixels, two pixels, four pixels, RGBA 0, 0, 0, 0 0.15. Save, and the card feels more on trend. Next, we'll create styles for the image. 
If we assume that every time a card class is in use, it has one image placed at the top, then we can use the selector card space image to define that the rule will apply to images only within card. However, to ensure it only ever applies to the first image, we'll use the direct child selector and what's called a pseudo selector to make our full selector card child selector image colon first dash child. The full meaning of this selector is now apply these properties only to images that are direct child of the card and are the first child element within the card. We'll start with one definition for border radius, which will round the top two corners but not the bottom two, with border radius 7 pixels, 7 pixels, 0, 0. Save. And then in the HTML, let's move the image below the H2 and save. You'll see that when the image no longer meets the first child pseudo selector condition, it does not have rounded corners. Move the image back to the top, and we'll add one more rule for margin, bottom, 20 pixels. Let's jazz up the card typography, and again use the card qualifier prior to the typography element tag name to create card space H3 with color Rebecca purple and card space P with color 757575 which is the lightest gray that achieves a 4.5 to 1 contrast over white and line height 1.5 which increases the spacing between lines of the same paragraph. Finally, we've arrived at the all-important Add to Cart link. It's common on e-commerce sites for this to have a more button appearance to help it stand out. We may want to have a button appearance on more than just card links, so let's create a rule for class button, with the first property being text decoration none, which will reset the text link default. Then add background color Rebecca purple, color FFF for white, padding 0.5M, which will be the vertical padding, space 1M, which will be the horizontal padding, and border radius 4 pixels. Those are all properties we're familiar with, so let's save. But before we see the results, we need to add the button class to the A tag in the HTML and then save. It looks pretty good, except it seems to be overlapping the bottom spacing of the card. Let's inspect and see what's happening. If we inspect the card, we see that the padding seems to go into the button and our button text is resting there. This is because links are inline elements and only their horizontal padding is added into the box model algorithm in terms of changing their position in relation to other elements. Using Inspector, we can change the display property to block, which we learned is the complement to inline. But that's not quite right. We don't want the button to take up the full width, although it did remove the overlapping behavior. Instead, a third available value for display is inline-block which allows the element width to behave using the inline algorithm, but also allows it to have both its vertical margin and padding used in the display algorithm as well. Toggling this on and off, you can see it also increases the space above the button, due to it now being pushed down by the paragraph's bottom margin. Let's add the display inline block to our rule and save. We're almost done, but it would be nice for this price to stand out a bit more. So we'll create a rule with the selector card space h3 space m, and let's place it following our card h3 rule for the sake of organization. With the properties padding 0.25m, background color, and we'll pull the value that we used for the block quote background color in the blog lesson, and border radius 4 pixels. Great, it stands out more, 
But what happens if we have a longer product title? Say, Whizbang Widget Super Deluxe. Let's update the HTML and find out. Oops, the price gets knocked down to the next line. And since it's an inline element, it's overlapping the text. A newer display value is grid, and this will let us define virtual columns and rows for our content to live in. If we define display grid on the card H3, then a grid cell is created for the text and one for the M tag. Save, and you'll see the price is still below the title, but it's now appearing as a block due to the default grid algorithm. If we inspect the H3, the inspector has added dashed lines to visualize each grid cell. What we want is two columns, where the price takes up the width it needs, but always stays to the far right of the title. We can accomplish this by adding grid-template-columns with the value 1fr space auto. Each width designation with this property defines a separate column. So with two definitions, we've created two columns. The fr keyword means fraction and is unique to grid. And using it requests the browser to compute the available fraction of space that is left to distribute to that column or row. In this case, it will take up the remaining space not needed for the price to fit. Save, and that's almost what we want. The final property we will add to the H3 rule is align-items start, which defines how the grid cell content should horizontally align in relation to each other. Save, and you'll see the M is now aligned to the top relative to the product title. This has consequently also fixed its height by not allowing it to stretch the full height of the virtual row. Now we just need to add back in a couple more cards. So let's copy our card HTML twice to have three cards again and save. The first apparent thing is that the cards are overflowing the viewable browser area. The reason is that the absolute width we used on the card class of 320 pixels. Again, that was for demonstration purposes of our original HTML lesson. We will remove the width on card and then change card-row to use grid for display. Then we'll set up grid template columns of 32%, 32%, 32% for three columns. The existing justify content space between rule will distribute any leftover space between each card. But we still have an overflow of the viewable area. Why is that? The reason will not be apparent even from inspecting, but is the type of thing to file away in your memory. What is happening is that the browser is able to infer the image display size, and so the image width is keeping the cards wide. The essential rule to memorize for this scenario is max-width 100% and height auto, which means the image should take up no more than 100% of the available space within its container, and that its height should proportionately resize. We'll add this definition to our rule for card images. And we now have three equal width, nicely styled cards. We'll learn more tricks for card layouts in our capstone project. Stay tuned for the next video where we will learn how browser compatibility impacts our CSS. Be sure to subscribe. Support this project on Patreon. The link is in the video description.